good evening. Let me bid you a warm welcome to our gospel service on Facebook Live here tonight at Bambridge Baptist Church. It's good to have you along, and we're so pleased that you're joining us on Facebook. This evening, our speaker will be our pastor, Pastor Taylor. He'll be bringing the gospel message. Later on, um, the young people would normally meet at 8 o'clock, but there will be no young people's fellowship this evening that will recommence next week. Uh, that takes us round to Wednesday, and on Wednesday at 8 p.m., we'll have our Bible study again on Facebook Live, and we'd love to have you along for that. And Pastor Taylor will be continuing his series in the Epistle of James. Next Lord's Day, the Sunday School will begin again, and then at 11.30, we'll have our morning meeting and breaking of bread, and Pastor John will be speaking, and then at 6.30, will be the Gospel meeting again, Facebook Live, and I will be responsible for that meeting. At 8 p.m. next Lord's Day, the Young People's Fellowship will recommence. And then the, that same week, the Good News Club will begin again on Tuesday, the 12th of January. And all of those announcements, of course, are made subject to the will of the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a little program. We're going to have Peter Mander singing a little later on. Um, but before that happens, let me pray and let me commit our time to the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we come into your most holy presence and we thank you, our God, for this your day. We thank you for the many privileges and blessings that we've enjoyed in this day already. We thank you, our God, for our fellowship this morning as we gathered around your precious word and we listened to it be proclaimed. And we thank you, our God, for the reminder of what a great God we have, that we are a people who have been chosen, a people who have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that for those of us who know you as Savior, that the Holy Spirit dwells within us and sanctifies us daily. And Father, we praise you for that. We thank you for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, that we can cry out, I've been redeemed. And Father, we thank you too for the blessing of gathering around the Lord's table for, for your children and how we were able to remember our Savior and all that he has done for us. Father, we thank you that tonight we have yet another opportunity to proclaim the best message that we could ever proclaim, the best news that we could ever proclaim, that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Thank you, Father, for such a wonderful message. Thank you, Father, for your love towards us. Thank you, Father, for the grace and the mercy that you have extended towards us. We are so undeserving. We don't deserve one part of your love, and yet, Father, you love us with an everlasting love. And we thank you, God, that as we opened your word tonight, that this gospel message can still change lives. We thank you, Father, we still live in the days of grace. And Father, we pray for those who will listen tonight, who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. We pray that the Spirit of God will convict them of their sin, and that as we open this living book, and as it is preached, that, Father, they would hear words whereby they can be saved, and that, Father, we would hear of people coming into your kingdom this very night. Father, we pray for many pulpits around our country where preachers will mount and proclaim this wonderful message. Father, we pray for each one, and we pray for your blessing upon them across our province this evening. Father, we pray that this will be a night that will be wonderful for the kingdom of heaven, and that all glory would go to you alone. Father, we do pray for many in our assembly who are unwell at this time, and Father, we pray that you will continue to be with them, that they will know your presence with them, and that, Father, you will draw them close to yourselves, that they would draw nigh unto you. You have promised you will draw nigh unto them as well. So, Father, we pray for them this evening. We pray for a sense that you are with them, and we do pray, O oh God, that you will bring each to a measure of health and strength. Father, we thank you for our time. And Father, we pray for each one that listens. Many will have burdens. Many will have concerns, worries about the week ahead. And Father, we pray that you will minister to every heart this evening. Father, may we have our hearts that are open, ears that are ready to listen. 
And Father, we pray that you will impact each life that listens into our service this evening. Father, we pray all these things for your glory alone, and we pray them in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks to Pastor Peter for leading us tonight in our gospel meeting. Thanks also to Peter Mander for allowing us to use a couple of videos that he has sent to us that we might use them again tonight in our gospel meeting. So we appreciate both of those. If you've got a Bible, turn with me, please, to the book of Romans. And we're going to turn to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to read just the first seven verses together. Romans chapter 1 and the first seven verses. Let's listen to the Word of God. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power 
according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. A number of months ago, I suppose it is now, we began a little series in this particular book, the book of Romans, which of course is a great book when it comes to us seeking to give an explanation of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through different circumstances. We set that aside for a period of time, but throughout the weeks ahead on a Sunday night when I'm preaching, we're going to be thinking again of what I've called this little series, Paul's Explanation of the Gospel in Romans. There are many people today who are confused about what the gospel really is, but there ought to be no confusion because the Word of God is crystal clear. And Paul certainly, in this particular letter, he gives us so many examples of what the gospel is and what the gospel does in the lives of those who hear the gospel and who respond in faith and who throw themselves on the mercy of God. And we began with these three opening verses here in Romans chapter 1, where we were thinking about the gospel of God. And this is what Paul says by way of introduction to this letter. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, whenever you stop and you think about those four verses, you can see that there are so many great truths that the Apostle Paul opens up for us by way of introduction to this great book. We see some very important information. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And even though that might be an opening statement, it's full of tremendous truth because Paul was a servant of Jesus Christ. The word is doulos. Paul saw himself as being a simple servant of the gospel that had been entrusted to him, having come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Remember how Paul was saved on the Damascus Road? He was united by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, who had bought him with his own precious blood. And Paul now saw himself as being a simple servant of Jesus Christ. But he was also called to be an apostle. And in other words, when Paul thought about himself, not only was he a slave, but he was called to share the glorious gospel, which he says he had been separated unto. He says in Galatians 1.15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. So Paul was a servant. Paul was called to be an apostle, and Paul was separated onto the gospel of God, and he was to take out that gospel to the very nations of the world. So that's the first thing it tells us, some important information. But secondly, we see a very important declaration, because Paul immediately identifies himself with something that is vitally important, and he calls it the gospel of God. This was a gospel that had not only won his own heart to Jesus Christ that day when he had repented of his sin and put his faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, but Paul realized that this gospel was so important 
for the world in which he lived. In fact, he said it was the very power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. You see, in our world today, there are two gospels at large. There's the gospel of God. It's an unchanging gospel. It tells us about our sin, but it speaks about salvation, and it speaks about how God wants us to live in a way that pleases Him. The other gospel, which is man-made, demands absolutely nothing from us. It has nothing to say about a day of accountability and realities like sin and heaven and hell are never mentioned. And it is so important for us, therefore, to think about that, because the gospel of man will have no lasting effect on the lives of people today, whereas the gospel of God is life-changing. It can take a man like Saul of Tarsus, who claimed to be the chief of all sinners. It can transform a life. It can give you something worth living for, and it can give you a hope beyond the grave and something to look forward to in eternity. And I hope tonight, as you hear the gospel of God, that you will put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, that brings us to the third thing this evening that I want to pick up again in these opening verses, not just some very important information and a very important declaration, but we see a very important revelation. Not only does the Apostle Paul establish that the gospel is the gospel of God, but then he goes on to remind us that this gospel is centered on a person. So many people today want to talk about their church, and they want to talk about their creed, and they want to talk about the things that they believe. But whenever you get to the core of all that they believe, the Lord Jesus Christ is seldom or ever mentioned. But when you consider what Paul says here about the gospel of God, this message is centered on the person of Jesus Christ, and that is the person Paul identifies for us here. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, you might say to me, well, there's a lot of things wrapped up in that I don't really grasp. I can't understand what Paul really means by these particular statements. This information, this revelation is just beyond my understanding. Well, if that's the case, let me simplify it for you just for a moment. You see, what Paul tells us here about the Lord Jesus Christ is all important. The Lord Jesus is at the very center of the gospel of God. There is no gospel without him. Paul makes that abundantly clear. The gospel is centered on his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The name Son, of course, speaks to us about the unique relationship that the Lord Jesus Christ enjoyed with his Father. If you're very familiar with the gospel accounts, you will see how that from time to time, the Lord Jesus Christ would speak to his disciples, and he would tell them about his Father. And he made a very clear distinction between them and their father and him and his father because the Lord Jesus Christ had a unique relationship with God the Father, and after all, he had come to do the Father's will. And the Father endorsed time and time again his Son, even in words like this, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well Please. So, this name, Son, speaks to us of the unique relationship to his Father. But secondly, the name Jesus speaks about his humanity, because Jesus was perfectly man, and he was perfectly God all at the same time. That's why we refer to him as the God-man. And yet he humbled himself to be born 
of a virgin. We have just come through the Christmas season when we have been thinking about the incarnation, how that Jesus came from another realm and he stepped from eternity into time and he was born of a virgin. And the proclamation of the angel was simply this, thou shalt call his name Jesus, the name Jesus speaks about his humanity. But thirdly, his, the name Christ speaks of his messianic office. In other words, he is the anointed one. He is God's Messiah. He is the one whom the prophets had spoken about and the one whom the world was waiting for as a fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture. And the name Lord speaks of his exalted position. He is the Lord Jehovah. Now, Paul has a purpose in introducing the Lord Jesus Christ to us in this way, because what he is saying to us is so important with regards to the Old Testament Scriptures, and I'll give you two reasons why. Firstly, he refers to the Old Testament, and he shows the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're not just two chunks of Scripture in what we call the Bible. They are inseparably linked, the Old and the New Testament together. But secondly, he shows how the Old Testament contained the promise of a coming Savior, and how then that the New Testament revealed to us how that Savior came into the world, and what was the nature of his mission, and all that he accomplished through his death on the cross. So when you talk about your Bible, make sure you talk about it not as two huge chunks, but speak about the Bible in all its completeness. But what does Paul say to us here about God's gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let me very quickly and very simply remind you tonight of three things. In God's gospel, we see the fulfillment of a promise. You see, when the Apostle Paul says about Christ and the gospel here, this was not something that was new. There are many people in our world today who perhaps have never heard the gospel. But in Paul's day, as Paul looks back to the past, Paul says here that the gospel was not something that was new because the writers of the Old Testament had spoken about it. In fact, the Old Testament scriptures, going right back to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the coming of Jesus Christ into the world was said like this by God himself, Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You see, right back at the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, after Adam and Eve had fallen into sin in the Garden of Eden, God banished them from his presence. He pronounced a curse upon the whole world. And yet, despite that pronouncement of judgment, God reached out to Adam and Eve and into the world in which we live. God reached out in grace and gave the promise of a coming Savior. God said that he would one day send a deliverer, someone who would come and defeat sin and defeat Satan at the cross. God promised that someone would come and deal with sin in its entirety and thereby bring hell-deserving sinners like you and me back into fellowship with a thrice holy God. How wonderful, how marvelous is that? that God, our great Creator God, even though we have rejected His ways, even though we have discarded His Word, even though we have sinned against Him, even we have chosen to go our own way in rebellion towards Him, that God in the person of Jesus Christ has made a way back to Himself tonight 
whereby sinners like us can be gloriously saved. And not only that, we can be reconciled again to God. Wesley, in a lovely hymn, says this, Depth of mercy can there be, mercy still reserved for me. Can my God his wrath forbear, me the chief of sinners spare? And I shout out tonight with confidence, yes, there is mercy for me, and there is mercy for you, and there is mercy for any one of us, and every one of us that will put our faith in Jesus Christ, because in love God sent his Son to be our Savior, and on the cross that same Son of God dealt with our sin, paid our debt in full, and made it possible for you and for me to have our sins forgiven. And that promise that I have mentioned to you tonight of a coming Redeemer or Deliverer, it's continually endorsed in the Old Testament through the prophets as God prepares the way for the coming of His Son. When the Lord Jesus Christ came as a babe into Bethlehem's manger, that's not just a lovely Christmas story that fills our hearts with joy. It's a fulfillment of the very purposes and the promise of God and Christ. Galatians 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, that tells me tonight that God's remedy for sin was no afterthought. It was planned in eternity past. We sometimes sing the words, don't we? Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. I want you to understand that. Calvary was no afterthought as far as God was concerned. It was planned and purposed and eternity passed. And when the fullness of the time had come, just at the right time in the history of this whole world, God sent his Son to be our Savior. He's the one who at Calvary's cross became our sin-bearer and our substitute. God not only planned our salvation, he provided it in the person of Christ. He purchased it through the precious shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And friend, tonight, that's wonderful news. Maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior. Maybe you think that this gospel, this good news that preachers preach about and other Christian friends speak to you about, well, it's not something to be too engrossed with. I tell you tonight, it is something that you need to consider and consider now because your eternal destination depends on what you do with Jesus Christ. God sent him into the world to be your Savior. There on that center cross, he delivered him up for us all. And Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself and he bore it all away in his own body on the tree. Dealing with sin in its entirety, defeating sin and Satan, conquering death, taking the sting out of the grave, making a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. That's why you need to think about and you need to believe this glorious gospel. If Christ has come, as Paul says, as the only Savior of sinners, if God has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world and delivered him up for our sins at the cross, do you realize tonight that if you reject Christ, you're rejecting the only one who can ever save you. You're rejecting the one that God has sent into the world to provide salvation for you. 
If you say to me tonight, well, that's fine, but I will not have this man to rule over me, then you'll live to regret that in the caverns of hell for all eternity. You can have a religion without Jesus Christ, and many people do, but you cannot have salvation without Jesus Christ. For he's at the very center of God's purposes for the saving of a world, lost in sin, undone before God. And if you miss him, you miss everything that's important as far as your soul's concerned. In God's gospel, we firstly see the fulfillment of a promise. Secondly, we see the character of Christ. Paul says something here that is very wonderful, and yet something that is most mysterious, because he says of Christ, he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. How can that possibly be? How can he be made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and yet at the same time, be declared to be the Son of God with power. Well, you see, whenever we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not talking about an any ordinary person. The Lord Jesus Christ is unique, revealed to us in the Bible as the God-man. He had a perfect human nature, and a perfect divine nature all at the same time. Now, as far as his human nature is concerned, Paul says that Jesus Christ was born of the seed of David. And Paul links here the Lord Jesus Christ as being connected with David, who was, of course, Israel's greatest king. Had he not been a descendant of David, He could not have been the Messiah, nor would he have had the right to David's throne. Had he not been the descendant of David, then he could not fulfill the great messianic promises concerning the future. But Paul says that he was a descendant of David, and one day he will come and he will sit on the throne of his father David. Coming into the world, of course, he assumed a human nature. Paul puts it like this, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. To think that the Lord Jesus Christ left all those hosts of angels in heaven and set aside his majesty, and came to dwell amongst men, and in the fullness of time, born of a woman, took upon himself a human nature like ours, yet without sin. The Bible says of him, he was wholly harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. But Paul also speaks about his divine nature, and we have no doubt to in any way doubt what the Scriptures say about him during his ministry. He said of himself, I and my Father are one. God the Father said of him, this is my beloved Son. You might say to me tonight, but why is all of this so important? Why stress the humanity and the deity of Christ? Well, let me tell you why it's important. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, here's what Paul tells us about Christ and about the gospel. He says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself because of Adam's sin. And way back in the Garden of Eden, man has been alienated from God because of his own sin. Man is an enemy of God. He cannot have fellowship with God the way that he is. And since it was God who drove man out from his very presence at the very beginning, it is only God who can bring man back again into his presence 
that fellowship with God might be restored. And only Jesus Christ, the God-man, could do that. Only Christ could bridge the gulf caused by sin. Only Christ could satisfy the demands of God and bring sinners back to God. And in order to do that, he had to die on an old rugged cross. That means that he had to die for your sin and for mine. That means tonight that he died willingly and shamefully and lovingly that you and I might be forgiven, that all of our sins might be removed. He had to satisfy the demands of God upon the sinner. And friend, because of that once-for-all sacrifice that he made on our behalf, through that death on the cross, you and I can not only have our sins forgiven and fellowship with a thrice holy God restored, but you and I can have the hope of heaven in our souls. You say, but why Christ? Is there no other person I can trust in? Is there no other way I can come? Can God not accept me as I am? No. That's why Paul centers all of this on the person of Jesus Christ. He's the only Savior for sinners like us. Neither is there salvation in any other. And the hymn writer says there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. This is how important God's gospel is. In God's gospel, firstly, we see the fulfillment of a promise. Secondly, we see the character of Christ. And thirdly, we see the accomplishment of Christ. Paul says this of Christ. He says he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You see, not only is Jesus Christ revealed as the Son of God and as the Savior of the world, but to emphasize further all that he is saying, Paul says he is the risen and ever-living one. And his resurrection from the dead was further proof, if proof was needed, that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God. This is what the Bible declares of him in 1 Corinthians 15. And of course, we know that 1 Corinthians 15 is that great chapter that speaks to us about the doctrine of the resurrection. And it says this of Jesus, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And on the third day, he rose again according to the Scriptures. You see, Paul gets right to the very crux of the matter. This is the very core of the Christian's faith. This is what makes God's gospel so different from what men are peddling today as Christian truth. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ die for our sins on the cross and in his death satisfied the demands of God, they took him from the cross. They buried him in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea. And yet the Bible says that on the third day, he rose again triumphantly from the dead. And tonight he lives in the power of an endless life. And God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name and all power in heaven and on earth is his. In other words, the gospel declares to us a living Savior. And you and I need to know why that's important. And I'll close with this. Whenever God raised Christ from the dead, he was declared that his work was finished. 
it is finished. The battle is over. Jesus Christ in his death on the cross has done everything necessary for our salvation. The work is finished. The debt has been paid in full. And in raising Christ from the dead, God has declared that his demands, his just demands upon the sinner have been met in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. His death is sufficient. And because of that, there's nothing more that you and I need to do but come as a sinner to Jesus and bow at the foot of the old rugged cross and say personally, I do believe, I will believe that Jesus died for me. His death was a once-for-all sacrifice for sin. And God has accepted that sacrifice made on our behalf. And tonight you and I can know our sins forgiven. But secondly, whenever God raised him from the dead, he has declared that there is a future for all who trust in him. The man or the woman who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ will one day share in the glory of of his resurrection. Do you know many times over the years in Christian ministry, you get a phone call or someone arrives at the door or the undertaker phones you up and says, Mrs. So-and-so has passed away. Mr. So-and-so has died suddenly and the family wanted you to know and out you go and you speak with the family. And it's a very difficult experience for any home to have to watch a loved one being taken from them and that loved one slipping out into eternity. But what a joy it is to bury someone who has gone out into eternity and you stand knowing that there is victory through Jesus Christ and because he lives, you and I can live also. Because in Christ there is hope beyond the grave. The man or the woman who trusts in Christ share in the glory of his resurrection. They look forward to heaven with confidence because the one who has died is alive and he's risen and he's reigning and he's one day coming to take his people home to be with himself. Or to know that with confidence is a wonderful thing in your experience of life. Whenever Christ died and rose again, it was the first step on his journey to glory. And when we come in repentance and in faith and we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's our first step on our journey to glory too. Oh, let me ask you as I sum all of this up. Are you saved tonight? Have you ever trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Have you taken this step of faith, knowing that he has done everything necessary for you to be saved? And if you haven't done that, I hope you'll consider these things that we have thought about this evening in God's Word. This is Paul's explanation of the gospel. God's gospel is the only true gospel, the only message today that we can trust. God's gospel declares Christ to be the only Savior for sinners. He came to die on a cross that we might be eternally saved. And God's gospel declares that on the basis of Christ's glorious resurrection from the dead, not only can we be saved tonight, not only can our sins be forgiven, not only can we be reconciled to God, but you see, when it comes to the grave, no fears. No fears. Why? Because he lives, I shall live also. Christ has died that we might live. And Christ lives tonight that we need 
never die. So why don't you take that first simple step in faith? Come and repent of your sin. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. This is God's gospel. And how you react to it depends on where you're going to spend eternity. And that's why I point you to Christ. He's the only Savior for sinners like us. And without him, you and I have no hope. We die in our sin. We die without hope. We die in Christ. We've got the hope of heaven in our soul.
thanks to Peter for sharing in ministry in song. Let's just pray together as we come to a close. Father, we thank you for your great heart of love in that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to be our Savior. We thank you that he came in fulfillment of a promise, that he came to lay down his life on Calvary's cross. And those of us who know and love him can say tonight, he loved me and he gave himself for me. But our Father, the gospel always brings a challenge to all of our hearts, and we pray that as we think about God's gospel just now, if we haven't yet put our faith and our trust in our Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, that this might be the very night when that great transaction will take place. So speak, we pray, in grace and in mercy through your word to each one of us. Thank you for this day, for your blessing upon us. We commend this week to you that lies ahead in your will. We are all as a nation passing through difficult times. But God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own. So, our Father, we just commend our ways and our wills to you. Pray that all that we do this week will know the blessing of God upon it. And we pray that we might ever look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and all these things we ask in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen.